quieting every inner and outer voice to attend to God. This summer we've been um, practicing silence as we begin our worship services by centering on God. Let us take two minutes of silence now for this purpose. Scripture reading this morning, I'm reading out of Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner reading in your towns, so that your male or female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Sabbath was intentional, was intended to shape our lives as a liberated people. The fourth commandment calls for a day of rest, even for people who had been enslaved. The Deuteronomy reason for Sabbath keeping is that our ancestors in Egypt went for 400 years without a vacation. Deuteronomy 5.15 Never a day off. The consequence they were no longer considered persons but slaves, hands, work units, not persons created in the image of God, but equipment for making brick and building pyramids of, hum of humanity was defaced. Keeping the Sabbath is meant to be an experience of the truth that you are not a doing machine, but a deeply loved son or daughter of God. He is not interested in simply using you. 
to get work out of you. Um, God delights in you. He provides free time once a week so that you might relish your release from all forms of oppression and slavery. So the question to consider is, how might the truth that God doesn't want to use you, but to, to enjoy you and give you a vision for celebrating the Sabbath? Let's pray. Lord, Sabbath rest is truly an unbelievable gift. Thank you that there is nothing I can do to earn your love. It comes without any strings attached. As I close my eyes for these few minutes before you, all I can say is thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's continue with another two minutes of silence. Amen. Let's all stand and open with our first song to worship and glorify our Father.
I, I'm all mess, gets discombobulated. For the first time in 35 years, I had a ward, uh, wardrobe malfunction. So I had to run home and change. And that's why I'm late. But it's good to come back and see so many here. Oh, this is great to have you here this morning. Welcome to the Hibbing Alliance Church. We are here because we prayerfully build, or we're here to prayerfully build relationships so that we can impact lives with the transforming power of Jesus Christ for the growth of God's kingdom. And whether you're a regular attender here or you're just passing through today, we're so glad that you're with us this morning. Just a couple of announcements, and I don't have my bulletin, so we're not going to get any more than that, but I just want to mention this. Um, you saw the video, I think, if you came in before the service started, of the story. And we are going to be launching that 31-week study that we will all embrace together next Sunday. So today officially ends our summer hours. Next Sunday, we want all of you to come back, if you can, at 9.30. And we are all going to meet next Sunday at 9.30 here in the sanctuary. Uh, we won't be doing that every Sunday at 9.30, but... To introduce the story, we're going to do that, both young and old. And we will kind of show what every age group is going to be learning. You're going to be seeing different things of great interest that you'll be looking forward to in the future. But we want to introduce it to you so you have a great idea of what's going on. That's why we have the Bibles out front, the story, available to you. If you'd like to donate $10 and take one, if you don't have it, take one anyway. Because we want you to begin reading that as we introduce each chapter of the story. Now the story is the Bible, but in this particular case, it is not the Bible completely from Genesis to Revelation. The story is unfolding what is the theme, what's the story about? And it's about Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. And so we're going to hit the highlights of in that 31 weeks through the Word of God um, how that all unfolds and what it means to us. So I, I cannot tell you, I'm so excited about this series. I hope you get excited as well. Come back next Sunday morning at 9.30. We'll be introducing it during Sunday school. The series will begin with the, pre, the preaching uh, next Sunday at 10.45, and then we keep going week after week. What we learn on Sunday, we want you to reinforce during the week by reading the book together or alone but so that we are reinforcing God's word and keeping it in our hearts so that we might not sin against God and we will fulfill the great commandment and the great commission. So that's all taking place next week. Be back at 9.30, okay? Don't forget, you come for a church at 9.30, that's great. But it won't be church, it'll be Sunday school. It will be church, never mind. It won't be a worship. You'll get it, you get it. Just come back. We want you to come back. And, uh, and also, in the entryway, at that table where the stories is, the, the Bible, um, we do have a sign-up list because we have on September 13th a ministry that we've been doing for a number of years now called Greenhaven, uh, getting to know our neighbors. And this year we're doing it a little differently. We used to do it on a weekend, and now we're just doing it for two hours midweek from 6 to 8. No? 4 to 6. Thank you. Ah, don't have my bulletin. I already told you. Okay, from 4 to 6 on September 13th. There's a sign-up list there because we need some help with certain things, a setup and certain materials, and you to be there to greet the people, that kind of thing. So please just stop by that table and see where you might be able to participate. Other announcements are in your bulletin. I'm going to have you read those. Um, but I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll come forward at this time so that we might receive the Lord's offerings. And as they do... Um, the, the President of the United States, Donald Trump, has issued a proclamation asking uh, today to be a national day of prayer for those victims uh, of the hurricane down in the Gulf in Texas and Louisiana. So let's take time to pray for those folks. Heavenly Father, we do know that you do reign. Lord, in our lives, we see things with great limitations. From your perspective, God, you see it all. We, with our limitations, do not understand things like storms and suffering and death. We only have a brief time here on earth, and we really want to spend it well and 
when we see these kind of tragedies, Lord, it, it breaks our heart. And yet, God, you are sovereign and you are just and you are loving and you are all-knowing and all-powerful. And you do reign. You're everywhere present. You're there with those folks in Texas and us right here, right now at the same time. So God, we unite our hearts together, not trying to figure out you or figure out tragedy, but knowing, God, that you were there in the midst. And so we pray for so many Americans that have lost their homes and their livelihood. In some cases, they've lost lives loved ones. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the reports of so many other Americans rushing with boats to their need. In the midst of a world, Lord, that seems to be so filled with hatred and animosity and protest groups, here we see, Lord Jesus, the true embodiment of what you designed us to be and that is to be people who are lovers of others to do good to bless those that might even persecute them to reach out and help and so God we I pray for those individuals down in Texas Lord it's such a broad broad area and region in Louisiana and Lord there's another hurricane looks like it's coming through Cuba and in the Bahamas, Lord, and God, we just pray that you would bring peace to the storm. And peace, Lord, to the victim. I do not want to forget, Father, that we have our own people here that are suffering sicknesses or they're trying, Lord, to grieve in a healthy fashion because they've lost a loved one. Or they're going through some hardships of their own that in comparison it doesn't seem like a lot but to them it is and so father i pray that we might pray for one another that we would not hide in our suffering but lord we would share in the community where we have need and that father your children rise up and minister and love one another Lord, I just pray that you will raise up an army of active followers of Christ that use their gifts and willingness for your name's sake to help others as we fulfill the love of God with our deepest inside, our deepest being, and love others as well. Thank you, Jesus, we pray in your name. Raise up an army, O oh God, awake your people throughout the earth. Raise up an army, O oh God, to proclaim your kingdom, to declare your word. Raise up an army, O oh God, raise up an army, O oh God, awake oh, your people throughout the earth.
principles and opportunities of spiritual discipline, spiritual growth, so that, God, we will truly be people who seek and act upon fulfilling the great commandment to love you, O oh God, with all our heart and all our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength, and that we would love others as well in the same frame of mind. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, just speak to us this morning as we finish up on our treasured trellis of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is very, very good to have so many of you here this morning on Labor Day weekend. You often wonder if people are coming or people are going. This time you're coming. Good. I'm glad you're here. If you are new to us, with us this morning, we have all summer long been going through a series called The Treasured Trellis of Life. And the word uh, trellis has some of its origins, the word rule has some of its origins in the word trellis. So when we talk about the treasured trellis of life, you could say it's the treasured rule of life. As every person who goes into business will tell you, if they want to be successful and if they want to get a huge loan to start the business, when they go to the bank, the first thing the bank people will say, or the financial institution people will say, is what's your business plan? Before we're going to loan you a bunch of money, we want to know that you have sat down and really counted the cost and thought through the process of what it would take to be successful. Because if we're going to loan you money, we want that money back. We want you to be successful. Well, when it comes to our faith in Jesus Christ, we have the same responsibility. In a sense, the Holy Spirit says, Okay, I'm calling you to salvation. You embrace Jesus Christ. And the great commandment for all believers is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength 
and to love others as yourself. What is your business plan to complete that work and to be successful? Because I want you to be successful. So this summer we have gone through the treasured trellis of life. These are just some of the spiritual disciplines that we could apply. And so as I see all of us who are sitting here, some of you have some of these disciplines and you're doing it well. So that's not one that you're going to, you're going to keep working on to improve, but rather you're going to continue to maintain your success, but look for one that is not as strong in your spiritual disciplines of life four categories that I kind of place them in is prayer, relationships, rest, and work. But under those categories, they kind of blend across the four. We've looked at scripture and you'd say, well, that one's a no-brainer. But the reason, one reason we're doing the story is because an astronomical amount of people who are in the Christian realm have never read the Bible. And so we're going to introduce some of you who may be in that category to the, the, the main theme of the, the story. And then hopefully after we're done with our series, then you'll take out your Bible that you have and go from Genesis to Revelation and read every single book and chapter and verse. We're not doing that with this. We just don't have a time in 31 weeks to do every chapter and verse. So Scripture is an important one. If you've got that one down, keep doing it. But maybe fun is not one that you have. Now, I'm not built that way. You were here for that message. I'm built for fun. So uh, this, I got this one. Yeah, I don't have to worry about that one. But I have to make sure it's honorable fun with God. Okay? The Bible does talk about not being frivolous and not doing foolish things. Fun can get you in that category if you're not careful. So it's under the discipline of the Holy Spirit. Sabbath. We honor the Sabbath in a way that in the New Testament concept, God never said, do away with the Sabbath. He said, I have come to fulfill the commandments. In me is the Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath. But I still want, the human body was constructed and God laid the framework that we would still take time that we would relax in Christ. We will rest to the point that we can focus on the Lord. Now that doesn't mean you sit on your couch with a harp and you all day long play. I mean, if God leads you that way, hallelujah, go for it. I'm not built that way. I can't even play a harp. But what it means is, in the activity that we have chosen with the, under the direction of the Holy Spirit to be our Sabbath, that we don't start tweaking and saying, well, I, I need to get this job done for work, and this is the only day I can do it, and now we're focused not on God, but on the job. Or even in exercise, or in recreation, in fun, we might say, I'm going to play hard, and at the end of the day, I'm exhausted, and I really haven't time to focus on God. I focused on me and my fun. Sabbath is that we take a day of rest where at the end of the day and the next morning we get up and we feel that we were in the presence of God that day and our bodies feel rejuvenated because of that rest. How you do that is how you have to decide that with God. But that is the Sabbath. Okay? What day of the week that is, you decide that with God. Alright? God isn't so interested in the day as he's interested in the fact that we honor him with the Sabbath. Family that we take time. That could be on the Sabbath and other days of the week. Family. Communion. Um, we're going to have that again today. We'll I'll talk about that a little bit. Service. We talked about that. That we are doing things for God. If we're going to love God with our entire being and love others, that means we're going to have to engage with other people and serve God by serving others. Missions. Another one. That we get involved in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ home and abroad. Finances. We talked about that week or that last week and that when we put finances as our God, it put a hindrance to what we can do for the Lord. So we need to get that under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Silence is another one that would be like on a daily practice where we just take time. Um, we, are, we are discontinuing. We've done this all summer. The centering on God. You were here this morning when Becky read that. She said, I'm going to ask for two minutes of silence. And then she read the scriptures and a little devotional and, and a probing question and then prayed. And we had two more minutes of silence. I don't know if you got used to that or that still was kind of awkward for you, but the reason it's awkward is not because you're not spiritual, but because we are Americans who are not used to pausing in life to be silent before God. And if God's going to speak to us, then we have to take time to listen. And so we modeled that for you this summer, and that this was the last one. So Becky, I wasn't even here to, to evaluate because we were joking about that. You did great, right? 
<laughs> and then today we're looking at community. This is something that for some of us, it's, it's great. And for others of us, um, I just want to be left alone kind of thing. Okay? Um, you may find this hard to believe, but early on when I was uh, in college um, and in getting the first couple of years of ministry, I remember having a discussion with my wife, Darcy, and I said, you know, I, I, I'd like being a pastor, but I, ah, there's always people always around. And she said, you better figure that one out. That was, that was in college, actually, because she said, you better figure that one out, Kevin, because there's always going to be people if you're in the ministry. And I did, and I'm having a great time, and I love being around people. But that was kind of my mentality back then. And some of us, some of you, are built with more of an introvert, individual kind of, this is my little bubble circle, and just leave me alone, and I'm a happy person. But God says we are all built to be community, and we're going to talk about that. I just want to read, because some of you are taking the notes that we provided for you, for us to fulfill the great commandment, this is to happen, will require developing a personal, customized, treasured trellis or rule of life, which is simply an intentional, conscious plan to keep God at the center of everything we do. One final thing before we move on. You may already have a rule of life, a plan in place, but we are created beings that grow. And so once you become established and you set that this is going very well, keep doing that, but then start adding something else where you need more growth. So for each of us, it may be different. Uh, we're at different levels of that growth, but we are never to be stagnant. And so God says, keep working that plan and keep making that plan for the glory of God and for the purpose of his kingdom. So as we end the series today, uh, I want to express a caution to each of us. Knowledge is of where one needs to grow is not helpful if action is not applied. This may be great stuff. You might go, wow, that was a great series, Pastor. I kind of hope one does. No, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> not that bad. Thanks, Greg. But the important thing is what we do with what we know when it comes to our relationship with God. We can't reach the top of a mountain to a higher level unless we actually climb upward. Sometimes the climb seems frightening and dangerous. That is why God created and emphasized the community of the saints because we don't have to climb that mountain alone. We are not alone on our journey. We have come to, uh, God has empowered us and fellow Christians to assist us and he actually expects us to assist one another. No one is to be an island on an island as a follower of Christ. Not anyone. And we're going to talk about that. Community requires participation. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 31, it says, And when they prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of the land of houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales, lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as they had need. No, I'm not doing a tithing sermon. I'm not, so you can relax there. But I am wanting to bring out the community of the saints as they live under the power and control of the Holy Spirit. Remember, in this culture, they didn't have middle class. They had rich and they had poor. That was it. But it says here that as the church came together, the first thing they did was that they prayed together. They prayed for one another. They prayed for themselves. They sought God. They looked for His will. They wanted to be engaged with God, not just mom or God, please be with mom and her bunions or whatever it is, 
but God, we are here at the throne of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, are, we want to engage with our God. And yes, we want to help one another through prayer. Prayer was a major, major part of what was going on in the church. That is the reason why, in part, that they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Because they took the time to seek God and to seek Him alone. And that is what's lacking in the Christian church, at least in the USA is we have prayer meetings and we have prayer gatherings and Bible studies and those kind of things. And, and what goes through my mind, and I'm not trying to be rude here, so please don't be mad at me, but what goes through my mind in, in American Christendom is that we have a buffet of things to choose from and we keep going back to the table for all those neat things like prayer meetings and Bible studies and oh, this is great and I can fill up and I can get sick and oh, I'm so full of stuff. And we never leave the table to go out and invite someone to come with us. We never go out and farm the land to produce the food to feed other people. You see what I mean? Christianity was never about just going to Bible studies and Sunday school and church. Those are all great things. I want you to come. Don't misunderstand me. But it's about taking what we're learning in those sessions and then going into the world and sharing the love of Christ. And helping people to discover the joy of salvation. That's what we're supposed to be about. And when we begin to pray together, then we do witness together. That was what was going on in verse 31 there of chapter 4. They had unity, and this is the big thing. Oh, I don't have my bulletin with me because I forgot it. Can someone give me your bulletin? Because A.W. Tozer, um, thank you. He's, he's quoted in the bulletin this morning. Um, Happily, he's, he's from the Christian Missionary Alliance, actually. Um, doesn't matter, because what he said was important, whether he's Alliance or anything else. But this is, this is what he says in your bulletin. Unity is necessary to the outpouring of the Spirit of God. If you have 120 volts of electricity coming into your house, but have broken wiring, you may turn on the switch, but nothing works. No lights come on, the stove doesn't work, the radio doesn't turn on. Why? Because you have broken wiring. The power is ready to work, but there is broken wiring. There is no power. Unity is necessary among the children of God if we're going to know the flow of power to see God do his wonders. Disunity is the broken wiring. Arguing and debating and, nit and nitpicking and saying this is my job or my power and my position and my circle and all that kind of stuff, that's disunity. God said we're to come together and to love him with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength and to love one another. And he put those two together from plural to singular. He said these, on these two commandments is the greatest commandment. Therefore, we have a responsibility as we're studying on this trellis of life, our personal trellis that God gives us, we have a responsibility to engage with one another. Unity together. Verse 32 talks about that. They were all in unity. And then what they did was bizarre in our mindset, uh, in our culture. They began to share everything, not just some things. It says they didn't even have anything they called their own anymore. Which, by the way, brings us back to our study on finances, is that it's God's, it's not ours. God owns it all. We're just his stewards. And they understood that principle, and they said, we are going to share, and everybody's going to be taken care of. They were bold together. Verse 33 says, and they had great power in the apostles, and Jesus, uh, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. They began to proclaim Christ. Folks, I understand what it is to be a Christian. Even as a pastor, there are those awkward moments where you feel like you should share your faith. But it's like, how's this going to go? Right? You have those moments. Am I going to come off sounding like a weird Christian? God said, I don't care what you sound like. Just share the truth. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. And so they had this boldness together to share the good news of Jesus Christ and as a result, they were generous with one another because they had a spirit of generosity that was in them through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's community. Community requires participation. They engaged with God, and therefore they engaged with one another. Community also requires cooperation. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read this, in the beginning of verse 12, For even as the body is one, and yet it has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, Because I'm not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our own, our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. There is the description of the body of Christ, the community of Christ. There is nobody in this room who's a part of this congregation or a part of another congregation. There is nobody that has a lesser value in the body of Christ. No one. God has given, and we're going to look at this in a moment, God has given every believer a spiritual gift to be used to complement the body as a whole. Christ's body is to be interacting unity. Interesting at the end, it talks about that, that uh, you can't, um, one member's honored, all members rejoice with it, one member suffers, everybody suffers. That's the way it ought to be in the body. Not that we want suffering, but the fact is if someone suffers in the body of Christ as a believer, both locally and the universal church, then all suffer. We should. If all rejoice, then everyone rejoices. I was looking at a, a video on, on uh, YouTube where there is this lady uh, in, I think it's the Astrodome, or what, maybe they don't call it that anymore, but the old football stadium. And of course, all the refugees from the hurricane are in there, and she's singing a gospel song. And I mean, th they lost everything. They're in this, you know, they've got these little blow-up mattresses and stuff, and there's about five of them, and some are keeping beat, and she's singing a song, and she's praising God. And guess what the spirits of everybody around her are? They're being lifted. And here I am watching from a thousand miles or so away, and my spirit's being lifted. I don't know that lady from anybody. I've never met her. But I see God working through her life and I'm rejoicing with her because the Spirit of God is being demonstrated in the midst of the darkness. This is what the body of Christ does. I also look at some of these pictures. I read the article about the um, mother that got trapped in a parking lot and the water began to rise and she took her 18-month-old baby and began to walk through the parking lot and was swept away by the current and the rescuers were able to capture her with the baby on, he was on a, in a, like a backpack, but on her chest. She had drowned, and her body floating in the water, and they rescued that baby, but the mother died. Suffer. And we ask God, why do those things happen? It's because sin is in the world. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And we know that a greater day is coming because of Jesus Christ. And folks, this is why God created a community of saints. Because people are suffering. And there are people out there that don't know Christ. And they're suffering in darkness. And they don't have Jesus. And they don't have any hope for tomorrow. 
And here he says, I got you who are followers of Christ to be my hands and my feet. Don't sit and bicker among yourselves and be disunified, but rather gather together and be empowered by the Holy Spirit and get out there and share the good news and help people discover there is hope in the world. We're to be interacting unity and value diversity. Verses 14 through 17 shares us that. We are built differently. We're going to talk about that in a moment. We are assigned service. We'll talk about that too, but in verses 18 and 19 it says in that passage just read for you that we all have a purpose. One might be the, the nose, one might be the ear kind of example, but we all have a divine purpose. We have a collaborative effort that we must accomplish. And therefore, it brings, in verse 26, it talks about, and if one suffers, there's an empathetic connection. Not a sympathetic connection, but an empathetic connection that we truly do feel what other people are feeling, both the highs and the lows of life. And we become a unique piece of the puzzle. You know, when I was writing this, I was thinking about a puzzle. Not any puzzle, but just a puzzle. And it, uh, you, you very rarely see somebody frame a jigsaw puzzle that's missing a piece. Because it's not complete. Matter of fact, I've, I've seen folks that I take out a box, a puzzle, and someone says, you might as well throw that away. A piece is missing. It's like, well, there's, this is a thousand piece puzzle. Yeah, but one's missing. It's no good. And that's the body of Christ. We are good. But if one of us decides to abandon our role and our responsibility, a part of that complete picture is now missing. And we dare not do that to the church of Jesus Christ and to God himself. So finally, community talks about participation and cooperation and also activation. In 1 Corinthians 12 again, earlier in verse 4, it says, Now there are a variety of gifts. We're talking spiritual gifts now, I'll explain in a moment. But the same Spirit. There are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Who does He distribute them to? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, according to this scripture, has given you at least one supernatural spiritual gift. Now, you might have faith. We all need faith to come to faith in Christ. We need to come to relationship in Christ. We have to have faith. But you may not have the supernatural gift of faith. You might be a great teacher, but you may not have the supernatural gift of teaching. Supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit means that we are endowed with an ability that goes and exceeds above and beyond what we naturally could do or even train to do. And the scripture says each person who is a follower of Christ has at least one gift because the Holy Spirit distributes them as he wills. Now let me ask you a question. Don't answer out loud. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? If you don't, you need to find out because God's not hiding it you just aren't exploring it. And then when you find out what it is, develop it, use it for the glory of God. It's for a divine person, purpose. It is a part of the whole puzzle for the body of Christ. Embrace your supernaturally gifted. Embrace that. And some people, sometimes in, in younger believers, it's like, well, I don't know what it means to be supernaturally gifted. And I heard you say something about spiritual, like tongues, and oh, I don't want that. Listen, God gives according to his will, not yours. And if God desire, desires for you to have something that we call the sign gift, 
then we have to come to Holy Spirit, embrace it. God didn't give the gift of tongues to everyone. We know that from 1 Corinthians 14. But he gave it to some for a divine purpose. Discover what your gift is, whether it's a gift of encouragement. By the way, I would say 90% of the people I talk to have that gift, according to them. I like to encourage people. Or I, like, I, I got the gift that helps, because I can just pick up something and move it. You may have. We all have the ability to encourage and to help people. Remember, the gift is a supernatural endowment to go above and beyond what we normally could be capable of. And then employ your gift. Verse 7 says, for the common good, for the, for the saints, employ your gift. And then examine the gifts. Not only is it found in 1 Corinthians 12, but you can find it in Romans 12 and Ephesians 4. Study on it if you're not familiar with it. And discover what God has given you. Listen, the great thing about being a believer, the first thing, of course, is that God forgives us and adopts us into his family and we are saved from our sins. We are redeemed and we're part of the family of God. But God doesn't just end there. If that's all he wanted, then he would put you to death and take you home and say hallelujah. But he leaves us here for a divine purpose. One is that we would be an encouragement to the body of Christ. That we would use our giftedness and our talents and our learned skills and we would employ it to help others within the family of God. It says to edify the saints, but also is that we would be a witness by how we use those gifts to help others discover the love of God. Just as a jigsaw puzzle is not complete if even one piece is missing, so the church is not complete if one saint is missing. So to truly love God and others completely will require a unified effort. Let me share this as we move toward communion. This is from Ephesians 4. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, employ you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just all, as also you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. As we move to the communion table, I want to just give you a couple of instructions. Um, we're going we're to ask you, uh, if, you're, if you're physically capable, to come up and receive the elements. If you're not, just raise your hand and one of our elders or deaconesses will bring you back the elements so that you can have the bread in the cup. I really don't know how much they put together here. Uh, only the deaconess know that. Uh, if it looks like we're getting low, then share with your family, okay, uh, together. The other thing is, is after we serve communion, and I'll give you more instruction on that in a minute, um, we also make available opportunity for you to be prayed over and for uh, whether you stand in the gap for somebody else or whether you have a need in your own life that you would ask God to address uh, we believe very strongly that Jesus Christ's body is for our body and that there is such a thing as divine health and divine healing so if you desire prayer then just go in that back room on the left or your right and we'll have folks there to pray with you during our, the last song of, of this morning the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, established this whole uh, ordinance for the church. He took the old Passover and moved it into himself, and that is the communion table. Because on the night he was betrayed, it says that he took the bread of Passover and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. He demonstrated to them my life. He hadn't yet gone to the cross, but he said, this is my body that's broken for you. So that when he was arrested and when he was whipped and flogged and beaten and spit upon and the crown of thorns were pushed down on his head, that his disciples and all who followed behind him would know this is what he was talking about. That he was broken and bruised for our iniquities and by his stripes that we could experience healing from sin and also even from physical sickness 
Then later, as they took the cup that they drank in the Passover, there was a cup called the cup of redemption. Jesus took that cup and lifted it up and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. In other words, he said, this now represents that salvation comes through my shed blood and nowhere else. And then he established this ordinance for the church and says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ till I return. So we get to come together for two primary reasons at the table of the Lord. One is, 1 Corinthians 11 says that when we come to the table, we are to examine ourselves. Because we know that as people, even though we're in love with the Lord Jesus, there's times that we fail God, that we leak in our, in our holiness, if you will. And, and there's times that we kind of ignore it, or, or maybe we forget we've done it. And we have this sin in our life, and God says, don't come to the table with that. That's, that's coming to the table in an unworthy manner. And people who come to the table in an unworthy manner are guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. In other words, they are guilty of the same thing that the people who called for his death are guilty of. So it says, examine yourselves. And ask the Holy Spirit, reveal anything that might be there. And then confess it before God and then take of the table together. So it's a time of confession, but also a time of reconciliation with God. Not that we've lost our salvation, but we may have tarnished it a little bit by how we've lived. God wants us to continue to walk in holiness. The other part of it is the celebration. Jesus died for us. He provided a means to be reconciled to God again after sin invaded the world through our rebellion. And so we can celebrate at the table of the Lord. So as when we begin singing this song, then I want you, if you are ready, to get up and come and receive the elements. Take them back to your seat. When everybody has, been, uh, has received the elements and have sat down, please don't, please don't eat or drink of the cup yet. We're going to do this as a community, as a family, together. But first we're going to pray. And then we're going to have a little few moments of silence so that each of us can examine ourselves so that we can come freely and without inhibitions to the table, O Lord, and celebrate our Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, you are awesome. Thank you, God, that um, even though you gave us a law thousands of years ago, you knew we could never fulfill it. We could never honor it. That we kept sinning against you as humanity. Thank you, Jesus, that while we were still in that sin, you were willing to die for us and gave us this ordinance called communion, the Lord's table. So, Lord, in these next few moments, let each of us be able to clear the clutter of our mind and listen to your Holy Spirit. And if there's something in the life of any individual as they seek you, reveal that to them so they can confess it to you and take of the elements and rejoice in that renewed relationship with you. I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please just take some time to pray as the piano plays quietly. that you would stand with us as we sing and during that song if you'd like to come and take the elements I'm going to ask our, our elders they'll come forward and
just position themselves here to minister to you if need be. Um, and it'll be the second song that we will invite you to go for prayer if you'd like to do that in the prayer room. But as, again, just a reminder, once you receive the elements, please take it back to your seat and just sit and pray. And, and at one point, then we'll ask everyone to uh, eat and drink at the same time. The worship team has already done this before the service to prepare ourselves for the service. And so just uh, join us now as we sing and enjoy the table of the Lord. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing. to retrieve the elements, Lord, let it really sink into our internal being of the sacrifice that you made in our behalf. Lord, sometimes it's so easy to, to again and again go over the story of salvation. 
to go over the Easter story of your death, burial, and resurrection, that it becomes a story, Lord, a legend rather than reality. Lord, help us in our faith to really embrace again what you have done for us. That, Lord, where we may lack faith, God, help us to increase. Thank you, Father for the joy of our salvation and for the call of, to love and the, the call to serve and, and to be a part of the body of Christ both locally but also universally. So now, God, we take the, the, the bread and we recognize, Lord, and we lift it up and say, thank you, Jesus. This is the symbol of your body that was broken for us. And we eat it, Lord, as a symbol of bringing you into our life. We take the cup that represents the blood of Christ that was shed for our iniquities. And we praise you and celebrate you and say, thank you, Jesus, for adopting us into your family, accepting us, not based on our worth, but based on the wa cleansing, washing of the blood of Christ in our life as we embrace you. Be blessed now, God, and thank you for the blessing as we eat and drink together in Jesus' name. Please eat and drink together. As we sing this final song, if you would like prayer or would like prayer for someone else and you want to stand in the gap for them, please go in that back room and our folks, our men and women, I will be there to pray with you.
Hallelujah, Lord. Praise your name. Lord, let us be community to one another and to the world that we will be the love of Christ, Lord, to all people and that we will share the good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in God's peace. Thank you.